Good evening and welcome to the uh, second half of our 2018-2019 school year. So I hope everyone had a wonderful New Year's. I'm glad you're here. So I would like to call to order the regular monthly meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, July, January 15th, 2019. On behalf of the members of the school board and our superintendent, I welcome each of you present and watching. Our quorum is present to, tra to transact the business of the school division. We will begin tonight's meeting with the invocation and pledge to the flag. Here, oh. <laughs> yeah, here to do the honors are two students from Dozier Middle School, Liam Lopez Torres and Ariana Lee. First, uh, Ariana will come forward and provide us with the invocation and she will be followed by uh, Liam, who will lead us in the pledge. So Ariana, would you please come forward and tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? It's a different name. Give us your, give us your, give us your name, darling. Hi, I'm Ariana Lee. Oh, there you go. Hi, I'm Ariana Lee. I'm in Virginia, but Dozier has really felt like home. Mm -hmm. I've gotten many opportunities, such as participating in the Sim Design Challenge, going on many field trips, and joining many clubs. Ms. Hastings has be really been a good mentor with nurturing the kids as if they were her own. And with that, one thing we go by at Dozier Middle School is, at Dozier Middle School, we have a mission. We expect quality instruction, student engagement, and positive relationships. Remember, we act with good sense, do what is right, are accountable for ourselves, show respect for others, and bounce back from adversity. Remember, if you have a problem today, seek help from a teacher, counselor, or other staff member. Let us help you find success in all areas, <laughs> academics, <laughs> behavior, and activities. We are the Doja Dragons. The mission is possible. We work hard, we expect excellence, and we have the brightest futures. At Doja Middle School, the mission is possible. Doja. <laughs> Ariana, that was wonderful. Now, Liam, would you please come forward? And tell us a little bit about yourself before you, know, you begin. <laughs> Hello and good evening, Newport News Public Schools and Community. My name is Liam Lopez Torres and I am a 7th grader at Dozier Middle School. I will now read a poem that I wrote myself entitled Dozier Dragons and I wrote this poem on January 11th, 2019 for the invocation. This is the poem. We are the Dozier Dragons. We are successful and smart at everything from math to art. We are smart in every single way just like how Ms. Haskins tells us every single day. We show respect for others and we bounce back from adversity. We're accountable for ourselves and we act with good sense, you see. Keep Dozier a no bullying zone. Don't be a bully, just leave people alone. We don't cuss, fight, bully, kick, punch, or hit. Cause if there's nothing nice to say, we don't say it. We all have the brightest future and we walk a bright path, yeah. Someday all of us here will all be successful at last. Because in this life, someday, we're all destined to go far. That is the Dozier Dragons, and that is who we all are. All right. All right. Please stand for the pledge. Oh, <laughs> of the United States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Liam and Ariana, what a wonderful, wonderful job that you've done starting us off on the year on the right foot. I think we should give them another round of applause. Both of you done an outstanding job. Supporting Liam and Ariana tonight are their family members and members of their school family. Could, would they please stand to be recognized? Uh, the board appreciates and encur the encouragement you have given these two students and uh, we thank you again for supporting them and bringing them here to the meeting this evening. So again, job well done. Uh, we're going to move the agenda, and uh, we'll move it to, uh, do we have some recognitions today? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Wait, what? <coughs> Dr. Parker, will you join me down in the front?
good evening. It's my pleasure to present this month's recognitions. Our first two honorees, our 2019 National Merit Scholarship Program commended students, were unable to join us this evening due to some school commitments. So we're going to invite Carson and Caitlin back next month so that we can congratulate them on this nationally recognized commendation. Our next honoree was named Tops in the State for her support of literacy instruction. Janelle Spitz, principal of Passage Middle School, was awarded Virginia Administrator of the Year by the Virginia Association of School Librarians during the association's annual banquet. Ms. Spitz, would you please come forward? I'm going to ask you to come stand right back up. <laughs> Each year, the Virginia Association of School Librarians honors an administrator for supporting the development of an exemplary school library program and for advancing the role of the school library program as an agent for the improvement of education. Ms. Spitz has positioned Passage Middle School's library as an integral component of the school's literacy program, which champions inquiry, reading advocacy, and literacy through making. She is a strong advocate for her school library and the librarian, Patrice Lambusta. One of their biggest accomplishments is the development of a library maker space, a collaborative workspace for making, learning, exploring, and sharing. Ms. Spitz and Ms. Lambusta work together to create an area in the library which incorporates some of Ms. Lambusta's ideas, including an 80 inch by 80 inch Lego wall. Ms. Spitz also created a magnetized Scrabble board for her students to play with while they're standing in line to check out books, thereby occupying every moment of their time. She's also supported and helped implement a one book, one school program. Ms. Spitz, congratulations on this well-deserved honor. <laughs> Joining Ms. Spitz this um, evening are Patrice Lambessa, the Passage Librarian. Would you please stand? <laughs> and also Mary Keeling, our, the School Division's Library Media Services Supervisor. And again, we congratulate you on this well-deserved honor. At this time, we'll take about a seven-minute break um, so that our honoree can leave if she chooses to do so. But I think Dr. Parker would like you to take some additional pictures. Um, during this time, our viewing audience will have an opportunity to view this month's school board spotlight. So we'll stand in recess for about seven minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. around with nowhere to go. And I was talking about More Newport News Public Schools students will have early access to a post-secondary education at a nationally ranked institution. By partnering with Christopher Newport University, up to 75 high school sophomores will be selected every year for the Community Captains Program, which will provide mentoring, college advising, access to on-campus resources, and early admission to CNU. At Warwick High School, CNU President Paul Tribble and NNPS Superintendent Dr. George Parker signed a Memorandum of Understanding. In the spring of 2019, the first class of community captains will be selected from an Achievable Dream, Heritage, and Warwick High Schools. Each high school sophomore selected must be a first-generation college student or qualify for free or reduced lunch. They must also have a GPA of 3.4 or a PSAT score of at least 1150. 
While still in high school, the selected community captains will be paired with CNU student mentors and receive additional guidance to prepare them for college. During their senior year, the students can earn college credit by taking a statistics class on campus free of charge. By maintaining a 3.4 GPA and completing all program requirements, community captains will be offered final acceptance to CNU after graduation from high school. This groundbreaking partnership will ensure more NMPS students receive a top-notch education, along with financial aid, grants, and generous donations to dramatically offset college tuition and fees, community captains will experience a full college experience with additional benefits and rewards. Water is one of the most necessary natural resources on our planet. So it's important that students at Sedgefield Elementary are receiving hands-on learning opportunities about using water wisely. AskHRGreen.org is a public service initiative that works alongside the 17 cities and counties of Hampton Roads to help improve and protect our waterways. One of these initiatives is Right as Rain, an environmentally themed outdoor art project that only appears when it's raining. Representatives with the City of Newport News partnered with Simone Pierce's third graders to select and apply two stencils that remind others to keep pollutants out of our waterways. Using a non-toxic spray, the students applied two coats of the invisible liquid and then waited for a rainy day to see their messages magically appear. Volunteers with Virginia Master Naturalist Program devoted time and resources to help educate Sedgefield students about the benefits of capturing and using rainwater to grow a beautiful garden. After planting a range of perennials and native plants in a brand new raised garden bed, students safely assisted with the installation of Sedgefield's first rain barrel. And these students' efforts are gaining national recognition. During their activities, a video crew with the National Wildlife Federation captured their progress to be featured on an upcoming segment. For Sedgefield students, a rainy day is a great day to learn and grow. Sanford Elementary celebrated the season by giving back to families in our community. The Winter Give Back, organized by Sanford's Youth Development Lead and School PTA, gave students, families, and educators an opportunity to move beyond the classroom walls so others could experience a bright season. The festivities started at Sanford, where families worked together making customized cards and stuffing mini stockings with treats. Students involved in the youth programs after school activities were delighted to lend their artistic talents. With gifts in hand, the families rode together on a big yellow sleigh to deliver warm wishes to Menchville House, a nonprofit organization that provides emergency housing to families in need. At Menchville House, over 50 members of the Sanford family serenaded guests with carols and passed out hot chocolate, cookies, and their handmade gifts. The temporary residents at Menchville House were delighted to experience some holiday cheer thanks to Sanford's kindness and generosity. On their return to Sanford, the families enjoyed a free dinner provided by Modern American Mixed Martial Arts and watched the Polar Express on the big screen. Sanford's winter give back was a huge success, allowing students to experience the joy of the season by giving to others. With the holidays approaching, Books on Bikes Newport News gave the gift of reading to students and families. Educators from Epps, Greenwood, and McIntosh Elementary Schools made time during the holiday season to spread literacy and good cheer. At McIntosh Elementary, Books on Bikes handed out free books and yummy snacks and hosted fun reading activities during a school-wide family academy. The evening event also gave families a chance to support the second grade's efforts to find a cure for childhood cancer through Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. Every donation gave students a chance to enjoy a variety of lemonade-themed activities. 
At the annual One City Celebrations Holiday Food and Book Giveaway, Books on Bikes set up shop to hand out free books to the hundreds of families attending. Books on Bikes also offered every student at Greenwood a brand new book of their choosing to take home for the holidays. And during winter break, educators from Epps and Greenwood traded in their bikes for a decorated school bus to visit student neighborhoods, along with Bar City basketball players from Woodside and Denby students from the Pride Mentoring Program, Books on Bikes passed out free books, hot chocolate, warm clothes, and stuffed animals to ensure students could bundle up with a good book. Uh, welcome back and hope you enjoyed the school board spotlight. At this time, uh, we have our, our audience and individuals, uh, groups, so they can come and speak with us. Um, we provide this time to the public to address the board. These are scheduled at the early part of the meeting and then near the end of the agenda. <coughs> the board is very interested in the ideals and opinions of the public and wishes to give the public an opportunity for input on the operations and policies of the school division. However, this is an opportunity for the board to listen to your comments, and as such, the board will not engage in dialogue with the speaker or audience. Speakers with specific questions will refer uh, their questions to the superintendent or the appropriate office. So that everyone who desires to address the board may have an opportunity to speak, we will comply with our three-minute rule uh, when you begin, the green light comes on. When there's 30 seconds uh, remaining, the yellow light uh, comes on. And then at the end, the red light and the beep. And we ask that you would complete your comments. Uh, that said, as you hear your name, please come forward. I believe we have a card. Do we have a card? Do we have a card? Yes, we do have a card. We have it. So I know we had a car. <laughs> Did it get pissed here? So I know someone. I know someone was here with a card, and I believe we have one card. I can't believe we started years off. If you had a card, please come forward and um, introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is Liz Colson. Oh. I'm a parent of a student at Woodside High. My topic is on bully and bully prevention. The Virginia School Board Association defines bullying as aggressive and unwanted behavior that is intended to harm, intimidate, and humiliate the victim causing injury or emotional damage. It is imbalance of power. Um, emotional bullying involves, and also cyber bullying, which is on the, the rise, and you see it all the time in schools. Uh, emotional bullying consists of talking about gossiping, rumors, uh, threats, all on, all on the, the social media, and also verbally, and so forth. Physical bullying involves hitting, kicking, choking, things of that sort. Um, I was, my child was uh, bullied at Woodside High and uh, she was a victim. So I want you all to know that uh, the victims suffer emotional damage. They have poor performance sometimes in school, health issues and things like that. It's psychological devastating and they, suffer physical pain. What I wanted to say is that bullying is not only student to student. Sometimes it's teacher to student, student to teacher, administrator to teacher, teacher to parent, parent to teachers, and so forth. We have bullying in all forms. And what we all need to try to do is to teach our children how 
to talk to people and how they want to be treated. Everybody want to be treated in a nice manner. There are three things that I want to bring out quickly. Uh, first of all, uh, most schools, their policies are ineffective when it comes to bullying. Most schools have three strikes and you're out. Zero tolerance, suspension, or expulsion. Okay. Most incidents of bullying are not reported because the students fear retaliation and they also fear, they also fear uh, suspension. Okay, three things I want to say real quick is that I want to ask you three questions. First of all, I want to know if the Woodside High School Bully Prevention Program is effective. Do you have any document-based information that this program is effective? I think not. The second question is how I want to know whether the students perceive this program as being effective, how are they comfortable with the bullet prevention counselor or the student assistant, or do they even know that person? If you gave them a survey, would they be able to say, okay, this is the bullet prevention counselor, yes, I know that person, or would they be able to say, I don't even know what you're talking about, I didn't even know we had one. Third question, is the program fair to the victim? I think not. My child was bullied and she was suspended. So usually the victim is suspended. Uh, we went on a roundabout way. I contacted, I, 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 we asked for an appeal. We had all these things and we never got closure. No one got back in touch with us and we still haven't got closure. What I'm trying to tell you all is uh, it's not about these programs, it's not about the athletic department. It's not about how, how, whether the school is a blue ribbon school in music or whether the kids graduate from Woodside and attend Yale, Harvard, Brown, or Stanford. It's about safety for our children, that they can go to school and learn in a safe manner, and the Woodside climate should be changed. If you don't have a bullying prevention program that works, Maybe you need to get with the parents, the community, we are concerned. Maybe they need to do role playing. Let the kids get intervened in the roles of a bully and the victim. So they'll have empathy for the victims. And I, I guarantee you, your program would decrease because bullying is on the rise and a lot of kids are bullied and they are becoming the victims and they are the ones that are suspended and, the, and it's Ms. chronic bullying is still going on. Ms. Colson, I thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more cards? No more cards. There being none, we will move the agenda to our consent agenda. Item 3.01, the minutes and work session from December 18th, 2018. 3.02, minutes, special meeting, December 18th, 2018. 3.03, minutes. Regular session, December 18, 2018. 3.04, financial reports, child nutrition service, December 2018, revenue and expenses, December 2018. 3.05, personnel report. 3.06, appointment of the school board clerk. That is it. Do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the consent agenda. You heard the motion in a second. Second. You heard the motion in a <coughs> second. Time for the question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just uh, this is an auspicious occasion that uh, we mark a transition of our school board clerk who has served us uh, very faithfully uh, for, I believe, over more, well over a decade, I believe 13 years. And uh, we wish uh, Ms. Hinton all the success uh, in the world in her new position. Uh, and uh, we're very excited to uh, be welcoming in our new school board clerk. Okay. Anyone else? I think we'll have uh, another opportunity to thank Ms. Hinton a little later. Uh, but right now, now, you heard the first, you heard the second, and the question, any more question? There being none, Ms. Hinton, for the, one of your last times, <laughs> please call <laughs> roll. Mrs. Searles Law? Four. Dr. Bess? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Mr. Harris? Four. Mr. Hunter? Four. Ms. Simons? Four. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Parker, do you want yes, to? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, it gives me great uh, honor and a pleasure to, to introduce our new board clerk, uh, Ms. Ms. Tiffany Moore Buffalo. If you'll please stand who has joined our team on July on January 2nd, excuse me, and has been working diligently behind the scenes uh, to get acclimated to not only the position of the uh, uh, school board office, but all, the school, the superintendent's office, but also a school board clerk. Uh, Tiffany comes to us from Virginia Beach City Public Schools, where she has served in several administrative uh, capacities, uh, most recently in the Office of School Leadership. And uh, she is a, uh, has done nothing but less than been very competent and, uh, and enthusiastic as she's reported on board. So we welcome you here. Tiffany, do you have any uh, family or friends here that, that you'd like to acknowledge? I have uh, two friends, Dr. Jackman and Mrs. Elizabeth Jackman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we welcome you ladies to support her. I see, uh, I see their uh, fellow uh, members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority and happy Founders Day to, to you ladies and thank you for supporting Ms. Moore Buffalo and being here this evening. And welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And again, uh, Miss Moore Buffalo, welcome. And since my um, better half is also in that, uh, AKA, I wish you a happy Founders Day to all the young ladies of pink and green. Uh, we're going to move to action items number four, four point zero one approval of the new policies uh, that was uh, given to us in previous meetings. Do we have a motion for approval? Uh, Mr. Chairman, so moved. You heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. second. You heard the motion and a second. A time for the question. There being none, Ms. Simpson, please call the roll. Mrs. Sorsmall? Four. Dr. Best? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Mr. Harris? Four. Mr. Hunter? Four. And Ms. Simons? Four. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item number 4.02, the annual plan for the education of the gifted. Uh, we had a, we heard um, a report during our last, during our December meeting. And um, can we get a motion for approval on that as well? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Second. You heard the motion, you heard the second. Time for the question. <coughs> there being none. Ms. Hinton, please call the roll. Mrs. Sewell's Law? Four. Dr. Best? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Mr. Harris? Four. Mr. Hunter? Four. And Ms. Simons? Four. Motion carries 7 0. Okay, thank you. And we have one last item here under action item 4.03, read for it, uh, resolution. Uh, can we have a motion for approval? Uh, we have motion for approval. So moved. Second. Second. You heard the motion. You heard the second. Time for the question. <laughs> Ms. Um, so we, we're really excited to be able to vote on this resolution tonight to support our teachers. Um, the board really felt that it was important to make sure that we let everyone know that we, we do support teacher raises um, in the state of Virginia. And some of us are wearing our red for ed. This is a movement. Every Wednesday, the teachers are asking us to wear red for ed. But I'll, I'll quickly read the resolution. Whereas the Commonwealth has no more precious resources than its children, whereas public schools represent the best public means to help Virginia children live rich and fulfilling lives, whereas Virginia teachers earn $9,218 less than the national average, ranking the Commonwealth 34th in the nation, whereas Virginia is a national leader in public education, commerce, civic, and health, we must act immediately to invest in our schools or risk decline, whereas educators and public education supporters around the country have chosen the color red and the slogan, hashtag red for ed, to call attention to the inadequacy of current school funding and the harm it does to children. 
Therefore, be it resolved that the Newport News Public School Board supports the aim of the Red for Ed campaign to enrich children's lives by increasing resources for K-12 schools. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Newport News School Board encourages all supporters of public education in the Commonwealth to wear hashtag Red for Ed each Wednesday to demonstrate commitment to increasing support for our public schools and those who work in them. Thank you, Ms. Simons. Any more questions? There being none, Ms. Hinton, please call a roll. Mrs. Sorrell's Law. Four. <clears throat> Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Mr. Ely. Four. Mr. Harris. Four. Mr. Hunter. Four. And Ms. Simons. Four. <clears throat> Mr. Hunter, for the last time now, <laughs> motion carries seven. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Ms. Hinton, thank you very much. You've done an excellent job uh, calling a roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll move on to item number five, reports and information, uh, 5.01, college readiness, dual enrollment, advanced placement, and the IB program. Good evening, Chairman Hunter and Dr. Parker, members of the board. Tonight, I'm excited to bring to you a presentation about college readiness in Newport News Public Schools. Last month, as you'll remember in our workshop, we did the career readiness component of this. So this is sort of the sequel to it. So there is no part three. This closes the college and career piece. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about advanced placement, dual enrollment, and international baccalaureate, three components coming together that really demonstrate college readiness. And we'll talk about how our kids are doing there. This really flows out of the Virginia's profile of a graduate, which works on four main domains, the content knowledge, the workplace skills, career planning, community and civic re responsibility. We're very fortunate in Newport News to be ahead of the curve when it comes to profile of a Virginia graduate. Um, a great example of that are the five C's that the Virginia Department of Education has adopted, critical thinking all the way through citizenship, uh, when I say we're ahead of the curve, as you know, for quite some time, we've had our college career and citizen ready skills because we believed it was important to measure things beyond just an SOL test. So when we want to do a comparison from the five C's and profile of a graduate to the CCC's of Newport News, that's a lot of C's, um, you can see that we have them all covered. Um, they may be slightly different, uh, but sometimes they're exactly the same thing. So we're really doing the right work. Um, and it's embedded in our curriculum, but there's still more work to go. So that's kind of bringing this presentation together. And it really connects to the new accreditation model. The entire Commonwealth of Virginia is under a new accreditation model this year, which has multiple components, with which, which we've talked about quite a bit. The newest one that we'll continue to dive in is this notion of college and career readiness, where a school can be accredited, a high school, um, or accredited with conditions based on their ability to prepare kids for college and career. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, but we want to dive into what that really means. Um, so this is the college career. And notice they have a different term, civic readiness. We do citizen readiness, but really at the heart of it's the same thing. And we need to show that students are getting prepared in these measures. So here it begins with the class of 2022. Those are our current freshmen. Um, it measures the extent to which students successfully complete. And students need to complete one of these. Many of our com kids complete more than one, if not all. Um, so advanced coursework, that's AP, IB, dual enrollment, career and technical education coursework, CTE credentials, the licenses they get, work-based learning, and then service-based learning, which once again is embedded in our curriculum, and kids get really <coughs> rich experiences throughout their pre-K-12 career. Tonight, we're going to focus on this advanced coursework piece, so really that college readiness component. Um, and just for clarification, it's an unduplicated count. So if you're a kid who has, um, and many of our kids do, we have, so we have an AP course, we've also taken a CTE course, we have a credential, we've done work-based learning and service-based learning. So Ms. Jones probably has more than, more than one up there, I'm sure. She only gets to count once, unfortunately, for, for us. But, uh, so let's dive into that a little bit and take apart each one of them. So you have AP, Advanced Placement, International Baccalaureate, and Dual Enrollment. And we'll kind of do it in order from largest to smallest in our school division. So the biggest push, and where we have the most students, is around Advanced Placement, or AP. And that's really where students take college-level courses while in high school. It's important to note that Newport News is unique and that we offer open enrollment to students wanting to take AP courses. That means you do not have, a, have to have a prior test score to get in AP. 
um, and we really want to move, remove all barriers for a student taking AP. We want you in AP even if you don't believe you could be in it. We'll get you in there, we'll provide scaffolds and make sure you're successful and then you'll go on to your next one and so forth. Mm -hmm. Another important uh, thing to note in advanced placement and where Newport News is really unique is that Newport News Public Schools, to the credit of the board, uh, pays for all advanced placement exams. Just to give you an idea about how much that cost, last year it was over $210,000 invested in students taking advanced placement courses. So removing that barrier. In Newport News, when you take the advanced placement course, you also take the corresponding test uh, because Newport News Public Schools pays for it and it's part of uh, the coursework. It's important to note that uh, while we do have open <laughs> enrollment, we do have some more diagnostic measures to help kids and that comes in the way of AP Potential. So AP Potential is a free web-based tool that we can utilize. It allows schools to generate rosters of students who show potential to be successful and pass an AP exam. It also says what areas they'll be most successful in. So we can be more diagnostic and if you have more of an aptitude in math and science, we can steer you towards those advanced placement courses. But if you still want to take AP Computer Science or AP Music Theory or whatever it is, you still have the ability to do that. Um, you get that information through PSAT scores. And once again, uh, 10th and 11th graders take the PSAT in Newport News Public Schools, and it's paid for by Newport News Public Schools. So you have the opportunity to take the PSAT. So once again, that's a heavy investment in the, by the school division at over $56,000 last year. So when you take those two numbers combined and you talk about college readiness, Newport News really invest in college readiness on the assessment side of things for kids to take those assessments. So advanced placement, to start to get into some of the numbers, Newport News Public Schools this current year is offering 28 AP courses for 2018-19. Now if you look at advanced placement and College Board, there are only 38 possible courses that you could ever offer right now um, in the world of advanced placement and we are offering and have kids taking, so the class has made 28 different advanced placement courses. So we're very proud of that number. Last year, um, 1,919 students took at least one AP exam, but combined those students, because a lot of our students, once again, take multiple, took over 3,200 AP exams. So a tremendous number of exams taken by our students. Um, 242 students were named AP scholars. How do you become an AP scholar? You have to pass three or more AP exams to be an AP scholar. So 242 of our kids, which is a great number. A number that, because of the large number of kids that are taking AP, um, we'd like it to be higher than it is now, and we'll talk about how we're gonna get there. But on 2018 AP exams, 28% of our students received that passing score of three or higher. So that's a target number we wanna look at. Um, with open enrollment and some of the factors we have, um, it is a good number for the large size, but we know it can be better because we believe in our kids and our faculty and the staff. And we'll talk about some of the things that we're gonna do. Um, but I wanted to show you a listing of events placement courses just so you can kind of see the different courses that a kid uh, can take. I was gonna say we go everywhere from A to Z, but when I looked at it, I think we only go A to W. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have AP World History, so I think we end at, at W. But you can see that you have them in your core courses, but you also have them in your arts, and you have them in your STEM courses, and you have, so it's a wide range of AP offerings for our students. Um, whether you're in a traditional high school program or you're in one of our magnets or academies, you have these offerings available to you. So I wanna show you a line graph of advanced placement enrollment. Once again, these are individual students, so a student can't count more than once in this data. While we're very proud that almost 30% of our high school kids take an AP test or take an AP course, that's a great number. As you look across those four years, those numbers are fairly flat. So while it's great to have 30%, we need that number to continue to trend upwards. And we'll talk about how we're doing that. The estimate for May 2019 right now is that we will go up a little bit, but you can still see it's still relatively flat. Um, so we're gonna be working on that number combined with the pass rate. And here's a big part of how we're gonna do it and why we went after this grant. As you're aware earlier this year, the National Math and Science Initiative along with the Department of Defense, uh, came together and we received an $800,000 grant. And that grant is geared directly towards advanced placement readiness. 
It supports teacher development. It supports study sessions for students and also classroom materials for kids. We've already gotten a jump start on this grant. So even before we took this big check picture, we had already sent 35 teachers to AP content training um, in summer 2018. And those are national trainings that we couldn't do with current staff that we have here. So a great opportunity with our high schools around advanced placement. So really a big strategy um, and a group of people that will be working on not only the flat line, but also the percent of students passing these AP exams. So moving from the biggest uh, group of kids with advanced placement into a smaller group, but also connected back to this accreditation piece is our International Baccalaureate Program. So IB, as it's often called, is a rigorous international-based curriculum, and we have it housed at Warwick High School. So 11th and 12th graders are officially in that IB program. Um, wanted to give you uh, a little bit of data around the International Baccalaureate Program. One of the main priorities in the International Baccalaureate Program is it's rich content, rich courses, but enrollment was flat. Um, so we've done a lot of work at Warwick High School um, with uh, Jason Holler, who's the program administrator, and the faculty and staff, and the trainings and so forth, to really recruit more kids. So you can see over a three-year trend, um, we have a 21% increase in enrollment. Right now, the number of students who are wanting to come into work for the IB program um, next year is at about 174. So that number is going to continue to grow as students interested in an international baccalaureate <laughs> program. So right now we offer 14 different IB courses to our students. So in 11th, 12th grade, you can take an IB course. Um, those IB courses also have IB tests associated with them, which you can earn college credit for as well. But we don't want our IB students to miss out on AP opportunities. So sometimes we can be our worst, own worst enemy with all these opportunities we have for kids. So we have, um, an op we have this in place for our international baccalaureate kids. All of these courses with lots of letters associated with them are connected to an AP exam. So if you're an international baccalaureate student at Work High School and you're taking 11 IB English, you're gonna take the 11 IB English IB test, but you also take the AP 11 English test. So you get both opportunities. So it's not an, an or, it is an and proposition. As a matter of fact, it's part of the contract when you go into the international baccalaureate class that you do both and we pay for both. So you can see that there's a host of courses that our IB students can take as well with AP tests associated with them. So it's a nice and proposition and kids don't have to choose between the two. Dual enrollment is the third part of this accreditation standard. So that is similar to advanced placement um, in that you earn, you have the opportunity to earn high school credit and college credit simultaneously. That credit is typically transferred to most Virginia colleges and universities. It really gives you the opportunity to experience the rigor of college level coursework. So that's the great news about dual enrollment. Dual enrollment used to be a really big number in Newport News in many school divisions across the Commonwealth. Um, but as additional regulations came forth through the Virginia college, community college system, um, these provisions came in place and it really had a, a detrimental effect to our dual enrollment numbers. Number one, it must be taught by a teacher certified by Thomas Nelson Community College. Those requirements have escalated over the years and become more rigorous, and we're okay with that. We're providing training for our teachers and getting our teachers certified, so we're having more opportunities. Minimum enrollment is a course in a course is set at 15, so you have to have at least 15 kids uh, to set a course. Um, all students, this is the biggest one. Enrolled must be taking the course for dual enrollment credit. So in previous years, you used to be able to, um, at Thomas Nelson specifically, be able to take, have a class of 25 kids, 10 of them taking it for dual enrollment purposes, and 15 just taking it for high school purposes. Mm -hmm. And that was fine. Now Thomas Nelson, or the past couple of years Thomas Nelson has come in and said, you can, no, you can no longer do that. Well, if I only have 10 kids taking it for dual enrollment, I no longer meet that 15 number, and I can't offer that course anymore. So it has really gouged our dual enrollment numbers. Another way that that uh, term that is used is no blended classes allowed by Thomas Nelson. Okay, so that's the bad news in it, and you'll see it reflects in our numbers. So I've showed you numbers in the thousands. 
Um, and now I'm going to show you numbers going down into the teens. Um, so we have 87 students that started last week at Thomas Nelson in the early college, early career program. That is also dual enrollment, even though they're on Thomas Nelson's campus. We have a couple schools that are able to offer U.S. history because they have teachers that are certified and enough kids to make a course. So you have that there. Um, we have, uh, once again, a couple schools doing English 11. So that's basically two courses. And Woodside High School is uh, the course that does computer art. And you can see they're just making it as a course. So if they had one less kid who was eligible for dual enrollment, we could not offer computer art. There are a lot of kids who would want to take computer art, but right now Thomas Nelson was not allowing us to have kids sitting side by side, taking it for different purposes. So that's the bad news, and we don't want to end a presentation on bad news, so here's the good news. <laughs> um, this is a dual enrollment update as of December 18th. Um, and so SACS, the governing body of community colleges, just ruled recently, it was in the Roanoke Times, in favor of blended classes. Technically, they didn't rule in favor of blended classes, but they didn't say you can't do it. And they didn't say they would not let you do it. Um, so what it does say is students can be enrolled in a college course with students receiving high school credit. That is a huge win for public school divisions and a huge win for Newport News Public Schools. So what you'll see moving forward um, is you'll see that number grow because we're now able to blend classes. We'll still have certified teachers. We'll still get 15 kids, but it, it will be in a blended environment, just giving a lot more opportunities and options for kids. And it matches what we do for AP, and it matches what we do for international baccalaureate. So it really has the potential to dramatically increase opportunities for dual enrollment, and that's a great thing. So continuing efforts and next steps. The biggest part in the AP world is to really implement that NIMSI College Grant Readiness Grant with facility, the fidelity, to continue working with NIMSI and the Department of Defense to make sure that we, we set targets, aggressive targets, and hit those targets along the way, both for number of students involved, but also number of students passing. So that's built into the grant, so we have a team working around that. We actually have a meeting coming up next week to look at some of those targets and the work we're doing. Uh, with our higher education partners, uh, we have meetings set up as well to expand those dual enrollment opportunities and make sure that our um, community college partners have the same understanding of the uh, ruling by SACS that we do so that for next school year we can get off on the right foot with dual enrollment and really expand those opportunities for kids. Wouldn't it be amazing for a kid to take AP, IB, dual enrollment and go into college with as many college credits as possible? That's a great thing. Um, so we also want to align our student opportunities to AP, IB, and dual enrollment, really working closely with our guidance counselors. You have a lot of opportunities and options in Newport News Public Schools, and sometimes they can compete against each other. So we want to make sure we show students and show teachers and show families that you can do all of these things, and here's how we would position those things together. So really working on our alignment um, and following closely, collecting and analyzing our data, both on an enrollment standpoint, but also on a performance standpoint. We want to be able to increase enrollment, and we know we can, while also increasing performance. So those are continuing efforts and next steps. We're in great shape when it comes to the college and career readiness indicator uh, connected to accreditation, but there's still room to grow and room to work, and we're committed to those efforts, both in the college arena and the career arena. So at this time, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Nicholas, thank you very much. Um, we have questions. Yes, Ms. Jones. You have a great presentation. Thank great you. Presentation, but I have two questions. All right. Um, the first one. One big problem that a lot of seniors um, we've encountered, seniors at Woodside we've encountered is the fact that a lot of us who go into AP English 12 and um, transition from AP, AP World History to AP Gov and AP English 11 to AP English 12, we found that we weren't able to do dual enrollment as before. So we have these great college courses in junior year, the senior year hits and we've got nothing. So how Correct. could we work on getting more teachers certified through Thomas Nelson in order to, especially in like English 12 and in the senior year, so that way we can keep up that. Yes. And we've heard that very loud and clear from our students as well. So we are working with our teachers um, to get more teachers certified. Uh, we don't want just because you go to Woodside that you have opportunities that you wouldn't have at 
Denby, for example. So we want to make sure that we have teachers certified at each of those schools so that kids continue that have uh, those opportunities. It's not good to have great opportunities as a, as a junior and really get on a roll. And as a senior, you don't have those same opportunities. So that is definitely a next step and work that we need to do as far as certification. I think this new allowance that allows for those blended courses will give us sort of the jump start to go back after those certifications. We were working on the certifications with staff, but then we weren't allowed the flexibility to fill courses. So it wasn't really worth all the effort going in, but now we can do both. So I think you'll see maybe definitely not in time for your graduation, <laughs> uh, but moving forward for uh, the junior class that's there now. Cool. And then my second question, um, another big problem is magnet students and dual enrollment as far as early college goes. A lot of times we and we being all magnets, we mm -hmm. aren't allowed the opportunity to have early college because we either have to drop out of our magnet and go to our zone school or um, other courses because I know sometimes magnet classes require you to take specific courses to remain in. So mm -hmm. is that maybe something in the foreseeable future we could get uh, some kind of program implemented so magnet students can still take early college without having to sacrifice our magnet senior year or no i think that's a great question i'm gonna give you some top secret information but i know it'll stay right here right <laughs> um we're working on basically a similar um idea so right now early college is all or nothing so you've got to finish first semester um english government and then second semester you can't have any remaining coursework well, that doesn't have to be that way. There are other school divisions and other places, and we've really been pushed by Dr. Park to kind of look at some of those options and opportunities so that there is an opportunity that if you want to take a magnet op course and it's in your senior year, but you've gotten all those other requirements that you can still do early college, you just wouldn't take as many early college classes as a kid who was there full time. So a part-time opportunity for early college, Thomas Nelson's very much interested in that as well. So I think that could be a solution for um, the problem that you're demonstrating that we see at all of our magnets and even in our non-magnets where kids want to do ROTC or band or you know whatever the case may be so I mean that's that's a very smart question um, and I'll bring you in on those meetings to help us kind of iron out those details but it, it, it is something that we're looking at and working on so thank you anyone else uh, Mr. Brown yeah so <clears throat> I believe I have uh, several questions uh, <laughs> um, well, the first one, you know, um, I, I believe that I read that we're close to 90% for students taking at least one AP, IB, or honors class Correct. Uh, within the division. So uh, that's that's fantastic um, and uh, very, uh, very heartening to hear. Uh, the one question uh, that comes off of that, though, in, then is what's it take to get to 100%? So mm -hmm. we're at 90%. Uh, what are some th ideas or thoughts that we have about getting to 100%? So this NIMSI College Readiness Grant and working with the facilitators in NIMSI has really pushed our thinking on that. Um, one of the things that we've been committed for is the open enrollment. And then sort of the push on that is, okay, you do an open enrollment, but it, your honors pot is this big. How many of those honors kids really could go here? And then how many kids that are you not getting into honors? So that conversation has been really helpful and we're diving into those numbers by kid, by subject, by high school. Um, that'll allow us to really kind of push not only that uh, 85 90 percent but also push those bands so right now we have about 30 percent in AP I'd like to see that grow but I'd like to see the honors numbers stay yeah. so we got to keep pulling those bands along so I think really that last step as far as collecting and analyzing data and then looking at it by school um, by counselor by student really getting down to that that granular level will be the fuel that we need um, and then the other part of the NIMSI piece are the student um, study sessions and the teacher professional development sessions. And once a kid is successful, many of our ninth graders take AP honors courses. Once they're successful, they believe they can take another one. So really starting them off as freshmen being successful and building those bridges will also help us do that. Okay. And uh, I um, see that we, uh, you know, we offer the, the PSAT in 10th grade, uh, which I think is, is phenomenal. Um, but then as well, in thinking about the PSCT and how it helps to identify kids for AP potential, sometimes, um, or a lot of times, oftentimes a, a child won't do well maybe the first time, but it, they'll do well the second time. So has there been thought uh, about offering it ninth graders and 10th graders? Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, the bridge being 
Uh, next thing is you'd like to see a kid take the SAT in their 11th grade year. Mm-hmm. So if they weren't thinking about college, well, now they've got some indications there. So is there some uh, any discussions or thoughts about ninth and 10th grade PSAT? So the, the 10th grade all in on PSAT. So all, all 10th graders and we have it for 11th too. The, the sticking point for ninth graders, and, and we can go back and look at it, is the level of math readiness. So the preference is to get to a level of Algebra 2 or further um, to do really well. So that it becomes a sticking point in ninth grade. We can certainly look at and do look at our kids who are ready in ninth grade um, to take the PSAT. So we do have kids that take. Um, it's just not a blanket thing that we do. Okay. Um, so eighth and ninth, as a matter of fact, we have we have students. Some students who are mm-hmm. in, in gear yeah. up and other yes. uh, places that are doing it. So yeah, I love to see that. I love to see that expand okay. uh, in the in the coming years because uh, I think the more um, the kids that get into the PSAT, then they uh, that scholarship offers come not just AP mm-hmm. potential, but scholarship offers and all kinds of things. Uh, come for kids uh, and then uh, last question just around uh, you touched on it the dual enrollment and the early college uh, and, and really wanting to see that increase um, that's a strong desire of mine to see that increase um, have we considered uh, there is a model of having say an adjunct having the adjunct uh, teacher come and teach in the school so that's a way to open up um, class possibilities we considered um, uh, if Thomas Nelson is not necessarily going to has a cooperative system, Christopher Newport University getting a getting an adjunct professor from over there um, uh, or Campton nearby and, and bringing them into so we offer those we can offer those college classes to yeah. the juniors and seniors. So we've had a preliminary discussion, a couple of them with Thomas Nelson about doing that very model. Uh, it helps us with the certification piece for faculty, um, plus with us providing transportation from kids all over the city to all over a different right. school. Cheaper. We could bring kids together and we could do. Um, take work example, you know, center of the city, you know, there could be space at work that is Thomas Nelson at work, but all kids could go. So there are lots of different pieces. We're sort of in the brainstorm figuring out. I'm sure it'll come before the board at some point once we get down that road, but really investigating all those opportunities that coupled with, you don't have to have all your requirements done. I think will allow us to push those numbers forward. So you not having to choose that you having all those opportunities. I think both of those will increase that number. I love to see the cost impact of it. Just being someone who had done adjunct professoring before, I think uh, you get about 500 bucks a unit. So the teacher themselves, the adjunct professor, is only getting 1,500 dollars. So and then the cost of of um, bringing the kids together. So you're you're only paying for the teacher's time to come in. That could be the the cost could be cheaper for teaching a class in our school as opposed to sending the kids outside. Absolutely, absolutely. Good point, uh, John. Mr. Ely. Do all the schools across the district offer the same AP courses? It really depends on enrollment. So if you have enough kids that make the course, yes. Some of the courses are specific to magnet programs. So um, computer art, um, is that was one of the dual enrollment courses that I showed. That's a Woodside specific because it's connected to the magnet. Um, there are several STEM-related ones that are specifically connected to heritage in their magnet. Um, but some of the, like AP government, is a course that we would offer at all schools. Um, and then it really depends on enrollment. So the exciting thing is 28 AP courses made this year. So we have enough kids in those 28. So a vast majority of them are available at every school as long as they have enough kids that want to take them. And do we see the enrollment across the district pretty consistent or do we find at one high school, say Woodside, the enrollment may be 49% where you go to Heritage, the enrollment may be 15%. We do. Is it pretty consistent across the board? No, that's a great question. Uh, no, it's not consistent across the board. So we do see um, vari- variance, I think would be the best word to utilize it as far as um, different places and strengths. So often it goes back to the strength of the teacher. You have a phenomenal teacher. That teacher's a recruiter. You have more courses. Um, so we see different pockets of it. That goes back to that, that data piece, too, is really looking at where the opportunities are. I, we want to get to a point that it doesn't matter what high school you go to, you have that same sort of core opportunities because you have outstanding teachers who've been trained, you have the materials you need and the study sessions connected to it. So um, we do see some of that variance. The opportunities are there, but are they making? Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Oh, Ms. Jones? Just a comment. Um, to what Mr. Brown said, I actually, my first time taking the PSAT was I could leave in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. I got the opportunity to take the PSAT, and then I took it again, ninth grade, and then 10th grade, and then 11th grade. So um, really a lot, a lot of experience with it, but they did make sure that we had the opportunity starting in eighth grade um, at Gildersleeve, which was great because it definitely helped when it came to my SAT. I just wanted to yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah. And probably, hopefully you probably did better each time that you took it, too. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. All right. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, next, we'll have um, 5.02, a budget update by Ms. Russo. Thank you, Mr. Hunter, members of the board, Dr. Parker, good evening. Um, I want to give you just a little brief update. We had some time with you in your workshop to talk about it, and I'm going to talk a little less about it tonight. I know you'll <laughs> be grateful for that. So um, let me start with a summary of uh, the governor's budget. Um, these are the additional amounts that we have in our budget for 2020 based on what the governor has proposed. Of course, the governor has given us his budget. The uh, House and Senate will each put together a budget. And at some point, there'll be a conference committee and we'll end up with a state budget. We don't know exactly the timetable. We'd like to see one uh, before April, but we'll see. Um, so specifically, if the funding for us for next year that's been proposed by the governor is $6 million for additional compensation. Um, you may recall that in this year's budget, we did not receive any additional funding from the state for compensation, uh, but we had a promise of 3% for 2020. So the governor said um, he'd like to uh, raise that 3% to 5, and he has funded 5% increase uh, for 2020. Um, but, and you know that it cost us about $2.2 million for each 1% raise for our staff for next year. If we were going to do 5%, it would cost us $11 million. You see we don't have $11 million to work with. So why is that? The state doesn't fund all of our positions. They fund about uh, just a little over half of our positions. And when the state does their math, they don't use current uh, salaries either to, to figure out their funding. So that's why the amount is much less than what we would need to do 5%. Um, and one other important point I think to make, the state is requiring in order for us to qualify for the total 5% that we would give 5% over the biennium. So for this year and for next year, we have to give a total of 5%. So uh, you know that we gave 4% this year to staff, and so we would need to give at least 1% in 2020 to qualify for this 5%. So the next thing on the list is additional funding to support students that are educationally at risk. We're receiving 1.3 million. There are really a very few strings to that, uh, as there are not any strings on the supplementary lottery amount below that. So another additional 600,000 there. Uh, the next three items on the list are um, SOQ funding. The, you know, a lot of our money uh, from the state is in our SOQ funding, and it, it uh, is determined basically on our number of students. Uh, our basic aid and sales tax for next year is up $1.5 million. And then we have two accounts, both ESL and remedial summer school, that are up based on our projected enrollment. Um, you know that our ESL population has been rising over the last few years. Um, this year, our enrollment is expected to be 1,550 students. And for next year, the state's projecting that we would have 1,782 students. So significant rise in the ESL population just over one year. Uh, for remedial summer school, the state's proposing, uh, the, the budget is proposed, assumes that we would serve 4,613 students in summer school as compared to 4,521 this summer, this past summer. Uh, and that is the number of students that are in remedial programs. You know that we serve many more students than that in, uh, in enrichment programs during the summer. We use grant funds to do that. So uh, one other thing I want to mention that's included in, this, in the um, SOQ funding that the governor's proposed, and that is additional guidance counselors. You've probably heard some conversation about that. Uh, the governor's proposal is that over the next three years, they would reduce the uh, staffing to, uh, or increase staffing to reduce the ratio uh, to 250 students to one guidance counselor at all three levels, elementary, middle, and high. Currently, uh, the levels of funding uh, staffing are 500 to one at elementary, 400 to one at middle school, and 350 to one at high school. What the governor's proposing for next year is changing those ratios to 375 to one in elementary school, um, 300 to uh, one in middle school, I'm sorry, 325 to one in middle school and 300 to one in high school. So that results uh, in, a, we would have to have six additional counselors at the elementary school level. We are already, already staffed at that level at the middle and high school. So, um, but if we get to 250 to one, we're gonna have to have a few more positions at the secondaries as well. Okay, so uh, what that means in terms of revenue in total for us is $9.8 million more in state revenue. We do not yet have any word from the city about what we'll, our city revenue might look like. Our federal revenue, you know, is um, largely impact aid, and we are in the midst of completing the counts for the student impact aid cards, and we'll finish that at the end of this month, and we'll see if we need to do a little adjustment to that number. If we do adjust it, my guess is it would maybe go down, as we've seen the number of federal stu connected students drop a bit. Um, and then our other revenue, we don't expect to see any changes there. So um, right now we're looking at an additional $9.8 million uh, in revenue to deal with. In looking at our areas of need, um, 
over time. Typically, these uh, needs don't change greatly. Uh, so let me talk with you about what we see the areas of need being. Our salary, salary increase for all employees is often at the top of our list. Uh, it's important to retain uh, employees as well as to attract good talent, and is, you have to be competitive to do that. So we need to do some salary increases for our employees. We also would like to continue doing some adjustments to salary scales and reduce our compression, both for teachers as well as some of our support staff groups. Um, we've been working on that over the past few years. We had took a break this year, but we'd like to get back to some of that work. Um, then we have some additional staffing requests for next year. I'll talk about those in just a minute. And new to the list for uh, the this has been on the list for the last few years, and that's health insurance funding. And again, we'll talk about that in just a minute. The non-compensation areas of funding that are identified as needs are technology replacement, often on the list, both for infrastructure as well as computers, um, some educational materials, and then some uh, funding for building maintenance. Uh, our building maintenance needs, based on our building's ages, um, really exceeds what we get for capital from the city. So we need to supplement that. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to talk about for just a minute is our um, development of a salary strategy as we approach next year. You know that for the last few years, as I mentioned, we've been trying to work on our salary scales to make sure that we're competitive with other uh, school divisions and that we can attract the best teachers here and, and support staff as well. So we've done, as I mentioned to you in the workshop, a number of what ifs. We really aren't at the point of balancing our budget just quite yet, but um, we've looked at, uh, since salary is such a large part of it, what if we were to consider a 2% salary increase, uh, knowing that we have to do at least one, um, and what, could that, uh, what would that allow us to do? Um, it would allow us to increase our starting teacher pay, and we haven't really picked a number yet, but um, I'm sure there'll be some pressure from HR to increase that. Um, and then uh, we also be able to work on our compression adjustments, both for teachers as well as for some of our support staff. And then I've noted here to advance the bus driver's job class one pay grade. Our pay grades for support staff are set about 3.5% apart. So this would allow for a 3.5% increase. We also planned, would like to in this what if, um, adjust all of our salary scales by 1%. So the bus driver uh, beginning pay would go up 4.5%. And I'll show you in a minute why I think that might be helpful. Eh, maybe I won't show you that. I think I should do that earlier. I do want to show the teacher uh, scale, however, um, comparison. So this is how we compare for the uh, bachelor scale at the top of this slide and our master scale at the bottom of the slide. Um, we're highlighted in yellow, and it shows how we compare to other school divisions in the area. And you can see that for the uh, starting pay, the five and ten year points, we're pretty competitive, uh, both on uh, the bachelor's and master's scales. But um, after that, we run to the middle of the pack. We don't really want to be in the middle of the pack. Uh, I don't think I mentioned, but if we, on our what if, um, for the teacher uh, raises, if we were to adjust for some compression, the teacher raises would average, would range from 2.1 to 3.7%. And for the teachers that are in the 10 to 30 year bands of experience, their raises would average 3 to 3.7 percent. So while we were doing 2 percent, that group of teachers would see 3 to 3.7 percent. So it really enables, by doing some of these compression adjustments, it really enables us to target some of our uh, salary dollars specifically to where we have the, the greatest need. And when you don't have all you need, targeting what you have is helpful. Um, okay, I mentioned health premiums as an as a area of need. Um, you have not had to increase premiums for the school board's budget since 2014, and I think that's um, something that many employers are not able to say. Um, we did raise our employee premiums in 2016 by 10%. Uh, we did also reduce our family premiums in 2017 by 15%. We looked at our family premiums at that point, and we were really not competitive with um, other school divisions for the family premiums. So we were able to reduce those, which was helpful. Um, and because our fund balance had been uh, performing pretty well, because our claims experience had been pretty good, uh, we were able to give employees a premium holiday in December of 17 and February, January, February of 18, so for three months. And Mr. Brown, I went back and checked. Um, our fund balance was $13 million in November of 17. It has fallen to $7 million in December of last year. Um, and it fell pretty precipitously. In January of 18, it was 11.6. In May of 18, it was at 9.8. August of 18, 7.7. Um, December of 18, 7. This is kind of the slope. So we have to do something to work on that. So what we've uh, expected is that we need to add about $3 million 
to the school board's budget for health care. And we're working with our healthcare consultant to figure out what we might do for employee cost. But I think it might need to also be adjusted upward. Okay, I mentioned that there were some staffing requests included in the um, uh, area of needs. And uh, this is the uh, list of those positions that have been requested. You can see that 11 and a half of the positions relate to ESL. I mentioned that we've had an increase in um, ESL students. I want to tell you a little bit about what the state provides in terms of funding. <clears throat> the state funds 17 teachers per thousand ESL students. That gives you, a, if you do the math, gives you a, a ratio of 59 students per teacher. They don't all speak the same language. So I would think that would be challenging. I mean, I've always thought teaching might be challenging anyway, but I think that would be almost impossible. So. Um, we right now have 47 teachers, and if we add six, we'll be at 53. That would be a, a ratio of 33 students per teacher, so still not uh, excessive, I wouldn't say. Um, and that assumes that we'll be able to fill the positions. They're sometimes difficult to fill. We still haven't filled all the ones for this year yet that were added to this year's budget. So uh, in addition that, to the teaching positions, the support positions that have been requested are a coordinator to assist with language interpretation across the division and some other division level needs, um, a family engagement specialist, an instructional assistant, a part-time reading specialist, and a guidance counselor, all to help our ESL population. So um, growing need and certainly some, something we need to address. The next on the list are licensed clinical social workers. We currently have two, I think, in the school division. We have some school social workers, but not licensed clinical social workers. And these would be folks who could help our students deal with uh, mental health challenges. And so as we've talked uh, a lot about that uh, in uh, lots of settings, um, it's a growing need in school divisions. And so Dr. Mitchell and her staff uh, have, have developed a way that eight and a half, in addition to the two that we have, would be able to serve all of our schools. We know that we may not be able to fund that all in one year. But Dr. Parker uh, encouraged us to let's show what the need is, and then we can figure out how much of the need we can fund. So that's the need. Uh, for security staffing, we'd like to uh, address uh, two additional positions at the elementary level. Uh, our middle schools and high schools we think are adequately staffed, but our elementary schools share uh, these resources currently, and we have some fairly large uh, elementary schools that um, have additional needs. So this would give us two additional uh, positions to do that. Um, ITCs in all one-to-one -one schools, that's a little shorthand, let me tell you what that means. ITCs are instructional technology coaches that work with our teachers in integrating technology in our classrooms. And what's a one-to-one -one school, you ask? So one-to-one -one schools are schools where we have one computer for every student. So uh, we have, have three of those currently, and this would give us uh, an ITC at each of those schools. They all currently have ITC resources, but some of them are shared, and some have lead responsibilities outside of their um, uh, responsibilities in ITC. So, that's what this would do. Currently, the state funds one ITC per thousand students, so we clearly don't have one for every school. And last on the list is a landscaper. We have 365 acres, one for every day of the year. Um, and uh, keeping that mode on a regular basis is a big challenge. Uh, we want to make sure our, our properties are safe for our kids and staff, and so that's just another thing that's on the list. Uh, so those are 26 and a half positions at a cost of 1.6 million. So for the things that are non-personnel related that are in our uh, budget, this is a, a pie chart showing what the breakdown of that is. The request total $12 million. And there's a long list of things. So let me tell you what some of the larger items are. Computer replacements for students and administrative staff, smart board, board replacements for our pre-K to second grades, um, phase two of our voice over IP phone system. We know that we had phase one done this year. We'd hoped to get phase two done. That hasn't happened yet. So right now, since hope is not a strategy, we're putting that in the budget for next year. Um, replacements for fire and intrusion systems at four of our schools. Um, replacement of PA and intercom, master clock systems at six schools. You, know, you think about this stuff, it's there and it works until it stops and then you need to have a uh, little intervention. So these are interventions for these schools. Some of them, some of our schools have their original equipment. It's on its very last leg. Um, gym floor replacements are scheduled at three schools, paving repairs, tennis court repairs, HVAC equipment replacements, lighting upgrades, uh, and on it goes. So you see that 3.8 million is for operations and maintenance. You know that uh, in past years as we have had um, 
uh, as we have incurred less for salaries than we budgeted because of, of turnover, we have used some of that funding to address some of the needs in our buildings. And so we're trying to get some of that in our budget. That's largely with the 3.8 million. And also we've used some of that funding for technology. And you see technology up here is in several different slices of this pie, network infrastructure, educational technology, and even building security. Our technology folks help us with some of that. So some of the things I talked about, PAs and intercoms, they're involved in, in making sure happen. And some of the other things that are up there are really not, not really not very negotiable. Uh, joint operations, you say, what is that? New Horizons is the joint operation. And so as New Horizons costs go up, they share that with the school divisions that comprise New Horizons, and we pay what they charge. That's how that works. Um, they send an invoice, we send a check. Um, and so that cost is expected to go up. Um, and then vehicle operations fuel. Um, we have to fuel a lot of buses and our white fleet. And so from, you know, we want to make sure we have enough in the budget to do that. So that's what that's about. Um, and then materials and supplies, that is not just for classrooms, although some of it is for classrooms, but all of our departments have material and supply needs, even our uh, uh, custodial staff and, you know, everybody. So that um, is uh, 1.2 million, but when you put it across the entire school division, it's really not, it doesn't go very far. So. So where does that leave us with regard to where we are uh, at, the, at the current moment? We know that we have 9.8 million in uh, new revenue based on the governor's budget. That's too early to say we have it because the state doesn't have a budget yet. Um, we don't have any input yet from the city, so we don't know our other large contributor to the revenue is the city, so we don't know that yet. Uh, and then with regard to our estimate of needs, the estimate of needs totals 23.6 million. Even the math impaired among us can tell you that that is not a balanced budget. So we have a lot of work to do. And so for the next uh, five to six weeks, we'll work on determining um, what of those needs can wait to be funded later. And we'll try to hone in on the revenue a little more closely and see what that might look like. Um, and so that's, um, that's the work ahead of us. This is a schedule uh, of how that will happen. Um, and there are several opportunities for the board to be involved, uh, the first of which is um, next Tuesday. You have a joint work session scheduled with the council. I believe at least Dr. Parker's hope is that we might be able to talk for a few minutes about the operating uh, estimate of needs as well as the capital uh, conversation that I know you need to have. Um, and then there's going to be some opportunities for input at the uh, February 4th communications forum, which we have with employees. There'll be an opportunity for employee input. Uh, Dr. Hart Parker is planning to host a meeting here at uh, the admin building in the auditorium uh, that evening at 6 for the uh, public to come and contribute input to the budget process. Um, we scheduled a meeting with you, another budget workshop on February the 12th at, at 4, I believe is what the uh, agreed upon time was, if that works for everyone. And then Dr. Parker will present his budget to you and to the public on February the 19th. Uh, you have a public hearing scheduled for March the 12th where you'll entertain comments from the public about the proposed budget. And then you're scheduled to vote on your budget uh, on March the 19th. At that point, it does become the school board's budget. And then, as is always required, um, we have to have our budget to the city by April the 1st. That's the state law. And um, Dr. Parker has proposed that we have another joint work session with the council on April the 9th, but I do not think that has been scheduled yet. And the city council, assuming that the General Assembly has completed their work and has a state budget, will need to uh, vote on our funding on the, at their meeting on May the 14th. So a lot of work to happen in a relatively short period of time, but we seem to manage to get it done every year. So <laughs> I'd be glad to address any questions, although at this point there are not a lot of answers. So. Uh, Ms. Russo, thank you for that report. Yes, sir. Do we have any questions? I, I, uh, um, Ms. Simons? Uh, thank you so much. Sure. And I just have to say I'm really excited about um, the governor's budget and providing extra funding for teacher pay raises mm -hmm. is wonderful. And also for the counselors. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, we are hoping that that funding could be flexible. Yes. Because in trying to support our teachers, we realize that um, there are a lot of behavioral issues mm -hmm. with our, our students. So right. it would be wonderful if we could use that money for the licensed social, social workers, workers yes. or behavior specialists. So we definitely want to get that message mm -hmm. across to the General Assembly that right. um, we really want this funding, but that we would like it to be flexible. Right, that would be great. And um, the only question I had is, um, 
I did at one point somebody contacted me about bus drivers who might be part time instead of full time. Do you think we could look at their pay uh, scales as well, and in addition to the the full time drivers? Um, yes. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you, Ms. Simons. Anyone else? Just just a general comment. That budget on uh, February 19th, just for the board's um, information, will be uh, balanced based on the governor's projected budget, uh, which, uh, again, as we are aware, the House and, House and the Senate will pass a budget, uh, will present a budget at a later time. The numbers will shift a little bit. Hopefully, they'll stay, they'll stay quite the same as the governor's recommendations. But the budget you'll see the, the budget you'll see on February 19th will be balanced based on the governor's proposed budget and a request for additional funding from the city. Um, so that that uh, will we will do the best we can to whittle down those 20 that 23 million dollars in in budget priorities to get to the essence of what we what we feel can reasonably be done. But it is our task to present to the city a, a balanced uh, needs-based budget that reflects the best interests of our students in Newport News and we will do that. Uh, so uh, hopefully the community will come out and support as we continue to have dialogue around what are our pressing needs as far as our operational needs in the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are no other questions. We'll move the agenda. Items 5.03, the attendance report, 5.04, membership report, 5.05, construction report or a part of your packets. If no one has any comments of those, we'll move on to item 5.06, comments by the superintendent. Dr. Parker. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this new year's truly brought a renewed and energized focus uh, on the work that lies ahead in Newport News Public Schools. Uh, next week is uh, School Principals Appreciation Week, and I want to take a moment before going into some dates and some upcoming events to thank our principals and assistant principals for their commitment to our students, academic and social development. Each day, our school administrators engage our students, families and staff to ensure that all of our students receive high quality instruction that prepares them to graduate college, uh, career and citizen ready. Uh, our leadership in our buildings is the front line of the things that we do to make, make our schools a special place. And we need to continue to support the leadership that we have in each of our schools and thank our administrators for the hard work that they do. So to all of our principals and system principals in Newport News, thank you. And please enjoy your, your recognition and appreciation week. I invite our families and community to join us uh, for the All City Science, Engineering and Technology Fair on Saturday, uh, January 26th at Heritage High School. The fair will uh, feature the results of some um, engaging experiments in technology innovations. The public may view the students' projects from 11 to 11.45 a.m. and the STEM design challenge will take place from 9 to 11 a.m. The award ceremony will be begin at 1 p.m. So we encourage anyone to come out if you're interested to see the great work that our students do uh, on a daily basis to come out on that day, January 26, to support that event. Now recently, this past week, some of the same talents were on display at the Middle and High School STEM Engineering Challenge, which was held at Gildersleeve Middle School. As uh, has been um, the past in, in terms of format, each Middle and High School sends one team. Now what was impressive that I saw when I first went over to Gildersleeve was that some schools sent all girl teams. Uh, I, was, I was very impressed to see some of our high schools had teams composed of all young ladies uh, to compete in the design challenge. Uh, all schools were, were presented with a similar engineering challenge to complete during a fixed time. The challenge last week involved building a wind turbine, uh, which would be the, uh, and it was based on how fast and how, how uh, efficient the wind turbine was. So each school had to build the wind turbine and the ones that were the most efficient and worked the fa and operated the fastest were the winners. This event was hosted by, um, by, in partnership with Domin Dominion Energy, who operate an offshore wind energy project in Virginia Beach. All students did a fabulous job of working together and completing this challenge. Uh, while each participant should be commended, special commendations go out to the top schools that were, that were awarded. First place in the junior division, which were our middle schools, was Gildersleeve, and congratulations. First place in the senior division was Minchville High School. The teamwork award went to Minchville. Best redesign went to Warwick High School and our Team Spirit Award went to Dozier Middle School. So thank you to all of those students who participated. It was a very nice event. 
Also, uh, on January 26th, the Citywide Student Government and the Lynx Incorporated are presenting a community symposium on the prevention of human trafficking from 8.30 to 1 p.m. at Warwick High School. This event will include interactive workshops for high, school, high schoolers and adults and presentations by state lawmakers and law enforcement. Admission is free and lunch is included. Interested persons may register by January 18th on our website. Newport News has been in the forefront of this issue uh, for many years. We were the first in the state to include human trafficking awareness and prevention in our middle school family life curriculum. Please also be rem reminded that our schools and offices will be closed on Monday, January 21st in observance of, Mar of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. <laughs> And our students will also be off on Friday, January 25th for a teacher work day, as well as Monday, January 28th for the staff development work day. Uh, as you are aware, we are in the process of developing a budget for the next year. Earlier this evening, Ms. Rousseau presented a governor's proposed budget and identified some of our funding priorities. Uh, I won't go through the date, all the dates and times again. I'll just invite staff and families to the community uh, budget development process, our input session on, on at 6 p.m. on Monday, February 4th, here in this administration building auditorium. So please come out. We'll have a short presentation on the budget for the community. We'll also have opportunities for the public to provide input and ask questions. And finally, I'd like to share an important youth development event with you. We're hosting the, an inaugural male empowerment conference. Uh, we call it Rise, the Power of His Story, His, H-I-S, His Story at Heritage High School on Saturday, February 2nd from 8.30 to 2.30. And this is open to all young men who attend Newport News Public Schools. Uh, I'm sorry, grades 8 through 11. <laughs> <laughs> right, Grace, that's a lot of young men. If we Okay, the conference will begin with the dynamic opening ceremony for young men grades 8 through 11, followed by a day of exciting and interactive programming, included, including panel discussions and breakout sessions, addressing such topics as building positive relationships, overcoming adversity, and academic achievement. There will also be informative sessions designed to, to provide parents and caregivers with resources and tools to promote student success and to assist with college and career planning. The conference is free and lunch and transportation will be provided. We ask that students and parents uh, register on our website by January 24th. We have a number of partners supporting this event, so we're looking forward to a grand first time ever event for our young men. It's an empowerment summit and we're look forward, looking forward to impacting uh, young lives on that day. So come out and support. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, we'll move the agenda to item number six. Uh, do we ha are there any more cards? There being none, we'll move the on to item number seven, matters by the school board. Uh, we'll have Ms. Jones. Thank you. Um, well, Dr. Parker <laughs> really took most of my comments. I was going to re remind everybody that the um, human trafficking event uh, put on by Citywide SCA in partnership with the Lynx will be happening on Saturday, January 26th um, from 8.30 to 1.00. Uh, registration does close January 18th, which is this week. So make sure if you're going to come, you use that link to register before then. And Rise, please come to Rise. It's turning out to be an awesome event. If you're looking to register for that, there's a contact for that in every high school. Um, so make sure all young men, eighth grade, grades 8 to 11, you're registering for that as well. As I posted on social media and then told many of the board members earlier today, which is something I'm really excited about, I did get acceptances into Penn State in North Carolina a and yesterday. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, those, I believe that's all I have to say um, this weekend. I'm ready to, you know, get started with the new year. So far, it's been very um, exciting and productive, and I'm ready to get jumping in. So are all the rest of the student leaders in the division. They're working very hard with putting on, helping to put on these conferences and everything. Also, to all students, um, if you're watching or listening, if you're looking to volunteer for the human trafficking event, we are welcoming those volunteers so please don't reach hesitate to reach out to contact me on my instagram or my twitter or if you know me and you have my phone number um we are or any member of citywide sca we are looking for volunteers so make sure you contact us we could definitely use you have that's all i have to say for tonight <laughs> thank you miss jones uh dr bess um good evening, good evening. today um, it's january 15th 
Um, today is the actual day that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was born. Had he lived, um, he would be 89 years old today. Um, as I just reflected back on his life, um, some of the things about him is that he was a well-rounded um, young man. He liked to play sports. He was a paper boy. And in addition to being uh, wanting to be a minister, he wanted to be a fireman when he um, grew up. And as we all know, he became one of the greatest people that had ever lived and had a um, profound impact not only on the United States but um, on the world. As our parent was talking about um, bullying tonight, I, I reflected a little bit and I, and I thought about all the wonderful things that I see as I go through the schools, um, throughout the schools in Newport News, um, public schools, and they are promoting things such as kindness and forgiveness and, and how to peacefully work out um, how to peacefully work out conflicts. Many times when we have problems like this, um, it's, it's not the external policies that will impact them, it's the internal things that we say and we do and that we teach students um, that will impact problems such as bullying. And just like um, Reverend King, um, seeds were planted in him. And I'd like to thank the, the, the staff members and, and everyone that works with youth in Newport News as we plant seeds in our youth so that we can make this a kinder place um, to live in. And as we celebrate his birthday officially on next Monday, I just encourage everyone to um, make sure that you're doing something where you, you know, making the world a better place. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Bess. Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you all for coming out tonight and continue support for our school teachers, administrators, uh, because they are, and principals, they are truly on the front lines where the rubber meets the road. Uh, Ms. Hinton, uh, we're going to miss you. Uh, at least I am. I don't know how to rest. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but no, we're going to miss you. And thank you for your unwavering support, uh, your steadfastness, your attention to detail, uh, which has definitely helped me out a lot. And I really appreciate that. And also welcome Mrs. Uh, Moore Buffalo. Uh, got big shoes to fill. Uh, I'm sure she already gave you a briefing on the personalities, so that should have helped you out. <laughs> that should have helped you out a lot, all right? But uh, welcome aboard. We're looking forward to uh, to working with you. Um, uh, a public announcement: uh, Congressman Scott got elected to the chair, uh, t elected to chair the committee of education, which I think that is a, uh, that is a great plus uh, is, yeah. for the state of Virginia and also for this area. So uh, make sure you reach out to his office and. and Send a congratulations or whatever the case may be. Uh, There's going to be a meeting Sunday, January the 20th uh, at 3 p.m. at Heritage High School. So we start the celebration here in our own uh, backyard. So if you get a chance, come out this Sunday, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, to uh, 4.30 at Heritage High School, which is 5800 Marshall Avenue. Um, so I think we've got a great advocate uh, for education. Um, and not just that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, would, I, would, I hope that we take a, a long, hard look at our communication strategy uh, when it comes to how we uh, communicate uh, with one of our, our major stakeholders of the city. Uh, Ms. Mary Lou, you gave a wonderful briefing, but I think the question I asked, I probably knew the answer that uh, the reason we are where we are is, you know, it's a possibility that we're not really getting the support, I think, that we truly need from our locality. Uh, as Mr. Chairman always said, we are an investment, not a liability. And so I, I would hope that we as a board take a strong, hard look at our communication strategy and, and uh, because obviously uh, some things haven't changed. Um, and so we probably need to change. Uh, at least that's the first step. Uh, I would like to see uh, us or the chairman or the superintendent or whatever, uh, you know, take to public radio a little bit to uh, tell our story. Also, we have local public television uh, that uh, we could use. Um, I would also like to see more uh, principal administrators at the local level uh, engage uh, and support it in, in the communication strategy. Because uh, I think it's gonna take all of us to change some hearts and minds um, is there, it can happen. Uh, I just think we need to take a long, hard look at the way we communicate uh, the, our efforts, our needs, our requirements, and to, you know, you know, just let the city know and the citizens know that, you know, we are an investment. 
And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank Harris. Miss um, Simons. Well, I um, also wanted to mention how much I enjoyed the engineering design challenge this week. Um, I had gone to a wind energy conference um, with some business leaders in the region, and they were all talking about workforce development. How are we going to inspire students to want to work in the wind industry? And uh, for the New Horizons program, we've been wondering, how are we going to get our students' attention? And how are we going to get them interested in wind energy? And then I turn up at our event, and there it is. It's a really great hands-on science learning opportunity about wind energy. So once again, Newport News Public Schools is just ahead of the curve. We're innovators. We're, we're already working on something that is really important to our region, which is getting our young people ready for the jobs of tomorrow. And many of those jobs are going to end up being in offshore wind in this region. So I just want to thank all of the teachers who brought students to that event. It was really exciting. And um, I just want to thank everyone who presented today. I know budget season is tough. Crunching these numbers is really d difficult. But um, I'm really looking forward to working with City Council. I did have a meeting last week with um, my counterpart on the City Council, and I have another one next week. So just looking forward to making sure we're all a team in Newport News and, and moving our schools forward. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Simons. Uh, Mr. Ely. <clears throat> I'd like to tell Kim how per um, personally I am thankful and appreciate all the hard work she did for this board. Dealing with seven personalities in the public, I'm sure, was definitely a challenging task for Kim. She did it without a hit. She was always there. Any problems, she answered. She always made sure this board was taken care of. So thank you, Kim, once again, for your many services to the City of Newport News and especially to the school board. Also, I'd like to thank Mary Lou O'Brien for putting on an awesome presentation. It feels good, especially with our budget season, to see where we're going much ahead of time so we the city we're partnering with the city and the city council we giving them up front this is what we need this is where we're concerned and this is the direction that we're going in i'm also excited about an event that councilman b2 harris marcellus harris is putting on january the 26th at the boathouse live um he partnered with me he said the concerns of so many students throughout the school year they run out of school supplies the second half <coughs> So what he did was he put together a school drive where he collect school supplies for children. So it's going to be this Saturday from 2 to 5 at the Boathouse Live in City Center. This Saturday or next Saturday? Um, yes, next Saturday. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. January the 26th at the Boathouse Live from 2 to 5. It's going to be face painting, um, gang awareness prevention, live performances, school supply giveaways, and also parent engagement specialists will be on hand to answer those difficult questions that parents may have about their children or different programs they could put their children in. Also, from 7 to 9, it will be a employee appreciation gathering for all employees of Newport News Public School System. It's totally free of charge, and it will be live performance there by a live band. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's going on January 26th at the Boathouse Live. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Ely. Miss uh, Searles Walls. So I think I speak for the board when I say it was an honor to um, propose a resolution to support teachers. Um, it is a challenging thing to go in day after day doing your job, keeping your head down, and doing it without the support of the people around you. And we do not want our teachers in Newport News feeling that way. So uh, it was an honor to be able to support them today, and we will continue to do so. Um, I really enjoyed the budget report because it gave us um, all of the things that are important to make our school run. Uh, it gave us an opportunity to make sure that we're considering the needs, and we're doing it collectively, and that is what this is about. We're supposed to give our voices um, we're supposed to be heard and we're supposed to make decisions in the best interests of our students. So thank you for giving us the facts to be able to do that. And I'm very excited about the options um, for uh, college readiness 
there are so many things that make um, Newport News Public Schools stand out, and that's one of them. Uh, the opportunity for students to take as many AP courses and have other options even uh, to go back and forth between the AP and the CTE courses. We really have a gym here. So um, I was very pleased, and thank you, Brian, for that, that informative um, talk. And then last but not least, uh, Ms. Hinton, it has been an honor being your board. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Brown. I would be remiss as well if I didn't thank uh, Ms. Hinton for her many years of, of dedicated service. Uh, one of the first persons that I ever met in, in coming onto the school board, uh, the person who gave me my orientation, uh, explained to me how the school board operated uh, and uh, kept me out of a lot of trouble in, in, in terms of providing me with a lot of information uh, over the years, um, uh, supporting uh, all the various uh, board events that we do uh, when we travel around the country and, and everything. So just a lot of, a tremendous amount of work I know goes into her job and uh, we're very thankful for her dedication. Uh, took my calls after hours and, and, and all, kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of things that she's done over the years. So thank you very much for your service. And uh, I say as a vice chair, we really appreciate you uh, and, and everything you've done. Uh, I, this is now New Year's time and uh, I got my New Year's resolutions uh, as well. So I wanna echo uh, the comments that my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Harris uh, mentioned. Uh, when I go to the communications forum, uh, the staff, when I talk to them, they, they, they know that I always talk about telling your story. And so I, I do echo uh, Mr. Harris's comments that it's very important for, I think, our administrators uh, in particular, uh, and as well as our teachers to tell their story of the good work that they're doing. So we heard tonight, um, we, like we talked about, nearly 90%, or I think over, a little over 90% of our all of our students take at least an honors, an AP, or an IB course. Things like that are things that you as, I think, administrators and staff can go out in the community and tell people. It's very important uh, when you hear things about our schools uh, in, the, in the community and say, well, in Newport News Public Schools, we have a 2% dropout rate. Well, in Newport News Public Schools, 28% uh, uh, of our kids are passing AP exams. Those are the kinds of things I think are really important for you to go in the community and tell people. Uh, we passed our resolution tonight, wear your red um, on Wednesday, but as well, um, don't, no, don't just stop there at wearing your red. Uh, go in and grab someone in the community who's not affiliated with the school division and tell them the good work that you do because that's really critically important. It makes our jobs, I, I tell uh, the staff this all the time, it makes our jobs incredibly easier when we're going and, and, and working on your behalf to try to get funding for the division if, you're, if our story is already out there. So um, echo those comments and I do think that we should uh, leverage all forms of media uh, including uh, radio and television to try to um, get, our, get our story out there which is just a tremendous story. Uh, and in terms of my New Year's resolutions, um, I'm talking on, on the board, uh, the three percent. So I, I've been holding up three fingers ever since last year when we did four percent, and ended every conversation with every single one of you on this dais with holding up three fingers. And I'm going to I'm going to hold up my three fingers uh, for a three percent raise for all of the staff uh, for this year. And I just want to share with you why I think it's so critically important. Um, what, whereas we passed our resolution tonight that said that we're, uh, Virginia is number 34th in the country in terms of uh, teacher pay, uh, that means that uh, if you look at any economic terms, we're in a shortage. So when you're in a shortage, uh, the school divisions that pay the most are going to be the ones that can uh, survive and thrive, whereas the ones that pay the least are going to be the ones that um, cannot. So it's, it's critically important, especially at a time like this, that we make sure that we're uh, consistently uh, driving for um, strong raises and, and 3% is really the number that I'm, I'm fixated on uh, and I'll tell you the, the some of the reasons why I'm fixated on uh, 3% so why 3 and not 2 well if and you can check this out yourself you go to the Virginia Department of Education website and look at the salary data 2% is roughly what all of the other divisions in the entire state are going to do so in the in statistics we have a concept called expected value expected value is the average so we expect that all the other divisions are going to do 2% so if you do 2% then you, if you're at the bottom, or you will not, you will not move position. So three percent is uh, is is a is a percentage uh, increase that is going to help us to uh, move uh, move our position and uh, really be strongly competitive. And so that's that's why I'm, I'm a very uh, strong uh, proponent of that. My other New Year's resolution, of course, is um, we started this at the beginning of the year. We're going to get Huntington Middle School. Um, we're going to get that school uh, on uh, in in the CIP and built. We're going to keep working uh, towards that, and we're not going to uh, relent on getting Huntington Middle School uh, worked on and, and built. So we have a, 
Uh, we have another conversation uh, with council uh, next week, and I hope that folks in the community will uh, pay attention to that, that conversation and weigh in and let people know um, how strongly you are in favor of having a school in that area because it is, it's important to the entire division. It's important to the entire city uh, that we have a school uh, in that area. It's very, it's very critically important. Uh, and then um, lastly, we saw it tonight. Uh, we we uh, heard about all of the dual enrollment, early college classes. Uh, everybody uh, here knows, uh, and I think Mr. Nichols, he gets tired of me elbowing him during graduation. I count everybody's robe who comes across and has an early college sash on, right? <laughs> I count them every single year and been counting them every single year uh, since I've been on the board. I want to see, uh, desperately just want to see more of those uh, students walking across the stage with that early college. It puts them in such a financial um, uh, advantage compared to everyone else. To, to imagine uh, college costs in, in, in many institutions, 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year, that if a child has uh, one year of college under their belt, that's $50,000 in their pocket walking across the stage. Two years, nearly $100,000 in their pocket walking across the stage. That's, you, you count it as money walking across the stage, uh, which is it's an economic driver that's economic return for uh, students and the entire area. And, and yes, um, many students will leave the state, go on to other careers, but what they will do is when they raise their children, they come back here to Newport News because they come back to the school divisions that have the most competitive programs because when, they want to ra when they're raising their children, they want the same advantages that, they're, that they had when they were kids. So uh, investments that we make in education, they, have, they pay a dividend, they pay a return to uh, our entire community. Um, and so uh, that's, those are my news, news resolutions as well as the, uh, the human trafficking. Uh, uh, we took the challenge when no one else was really thinking about uh, human trafficking and we adopted the prevention project from the Virginia Beach Justice Initiative, uh, brought it, that curriculum into our uh, middle schools. And uh, I believe that this is a great year um, for us to continue to be ahead of the curve and now move it into our high schools. So we were the first to have a middle school curriculum. We adopted ourselves. We can uh, do similarly adopt a curriculum for our high schools and, and, and continue that great work. So uh, those are my New Year's resolutions and I'm excited uh, about 2019. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. I guess that leaves uh, me as always between you and going home <laughs> and those, uh, those who watch the TV and, and get in the bed. Again, uh, great things are happening here in Newport News Public Schools. Uh, again, I just would like to reiterate and let the public know that next Tuesday, uh, January 22nd at 4 o'clock, we'll be at Downing Gross. Uh, again, this is a promise that this board has made to say that we will have more joint meetings with the city council. Uh, to my fellow board member, uh, Mr. Harris, uh, our communication strategy is basically what we need. You know, we have to communicate. And to your point and to Mr. Brown's point, uh, we really do, uh, we would like to get our principals and our teachers and students to get behind us, um, get behind that whole movement um, about um, getting raises for teachers, getting a new Huntington High School or Huntington Middle School or Huntington STEM Academy, uh, Huntington STEAM Academy, or whatever it may be, uh, but we need the collective, uh, as Ms. Simon says, we need to be collective in our movement. Uh, with uh, it being um, Dr. King's birthday, I mean, there was a movement, you know, not violence movement, it's just a positive movement, getting everyone on the same track so that we can do what's best uh, for our students and for our teachers and again for our, our families and for the city. You know, uh, no need to stand before a pain teller when no deposits have been made. Mm -hmm. Students are, you know, students are an investment. You know, students are definitely an investment. So with that being said, I'm gonna end my comments tonight by saying, uh, Ms. Hinton, you, <laughs> uh, uh, Ms. Hinton and I have must had over the last several years numerous of conversations. She has really guide, helped me guide the board and helped me lead the board as my uh, stint as the chair so far. Uh, always on time, always punctual. Uh, if, you're, if you don't have your paperwork in, she'll let you know. <laughs> and sometimes I'm not in too kind words, but she will let you know. <laughs> Miss Miss Hinton, this is going to be your roast. But she has been spectacular uh, when we do travel, especially here in Virginia. And when you're talking about school board clerks, uh, Miss Hinton's name comes up 
as like number one. It really uh, the VSBA, we says you have Miss Hinton, we had nothing to worry about. Uh, Miss Hinton is the best. I mean, I'm going to tell you that's the word I heard from VSBA. They said uh, when it comes to Newport News Public Schools, having all the paperwork in on time, being punctual, uh, being everything orderly, and being correct, uh, Miss Hinton says we don't even look at Newport News. We know you're here. And Miss Hinton's filled it out. It's done. And so to your great uh, leadership in conducting and managing this board, as you said, with seven people you never know every other every other year changes the seven changes uh we want to thank you and so on behalf of the school board i would like all of my school board members to uh, stand and uh, give her a round of applause thank you. we also have uh, a little special flower for you <laughs> I saw a saw peek here, but I knew they were for you. So these are for you on behalf of the school board, Thank the administrative you, staff. Thank you very much for I all, think. all that yeah. you've done. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. 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 Give me that gavel. We're going to miss you, Kim. So we do a few tricks. Let me let me close yeah, the meeting. Close the meeting out. And now that being said, I'm, I told you I was keeping my comments, uh, Mr. Claus, very, <laughs> very low. Um, if there's no other business to come before the board, I do um, adjourn this meeting. All right, Mr. Harris. Gavel, use the gavel. Can we get a?